Welcome to Strange News. In this show, we'll be taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will place all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Hello and welcome to all of my first time viewers and listeners and everyone watching this live. Before we get started, I do have a few quick announcements. There was no show of The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch this week, so we did not do a review on Wednesday. And then Thursday for Mysteries with a History, we covered 11 alleged UFO crashes and retrievals. Now, the great thing about Friday and Weekly Strange News is we do a gift card giveaway. The base price is 10 where someone will win a Starbucks or Amazon gift card. And the word of the day is hashtag unusual in all caps. And I will share my screen shortly for those to place that in the live chat. So if you want to make someone's day, put in a super sticker or super chat that says for the gift card, and I will rack that up and someone's going to walk away a very, very happy person. We'll do that drawing at the very end of the show. So I'm going to share my screen here for people to go ahead and put in that magic word, which is hashtag unusual in all caps. Place that in the live chat if and only if you are watching this live. All right. Only when, if you're watching this live. All right, and there is that. We got some pretty strange news this week. Some strange and some just incredibly bizarre. Are you ready? Are you ready for the strange news? Let's get into it. I'm going to take my screen off for this, and we're going to share a picture. So yesterday, Jimmy and I covered the Italy crash in 1933. I have some more details that I would like to add to that because that article was just recently released. Okay, so let's pull this up because this right here is Roberto Pinotti. He is the president of the National UFO Center uh, in Italy, and he obtained documents he claims that is evidence for the July 13th, 1933 crash in Italy and a secret department set up by then dictator Mussolini to study the alleged saucer. If you didn't watch yesterday's show, highly recommend it. But Let's get into this one, okay? So Pinotti's research has been met with skepticism in Italy since he since he first released it in the year 2000 and is still there's still little known to the outside world when it comes to this case. And as I had mentioned yesterday, I was a part of that category that was not familiar with this case until whistleblower David Grush had mentioned it to News Nation. He mentions here, Pinotti, this, this man that is on screen, he mentions, I and my colleague Alfredo Lisoni began investigating the story of the 1933 UFO crash in Lombardy in 1996 when we received some original secret documents about the case. The documents were mysteriously mailed to Pinotti from an anonymous source who claimed to have inherited them from a family member who worked on Mussolini. Lini's support UFO program. We have not heard this before, you and I. There have been a few other cases where people are just mysteriously mailed documents or film footage, right? If you know what case I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But this is rather odd, and there can be a lot of questions regarding this. First off, why bring it up now? Well, in this case, it was in 1996, right? But still, someone was sitting on these documents or it was passed down to them for, you know, a few family members. And then this person, this anonymous person, we have no idea who they are, where they come from. They don't even have a pseudonym to our knowledge. And he just thinks or she just thinks to themselves, I'm going to pass this over to a Italian ufologist and let them figure it out. And maybe they'll publish it. Right. It. Would you do something like that? Let let me refer this question to you, those listening to this, those watching this. If you're watching this on YouTube, share your thoughts in the comments below. I do read all of the comments, but I wouldn't like to hear what you would what you would do in this situation. Let's say you had documents that were passed down to you by your father, your grandfather, grandmother, whatever. And you think to yourself, I should probably pass these down. Would you or would you keep holding them and then just pass them out through the generations and only keep it in your family? 
okay? And Lotus Fire, thank you so much. Please let me know if that's for the channel or for the gift card, but thank you so much for that. And awesome that everyone is putting in the key word. Stargazer says, I'd be quiet. Well, let me ask you another question. Why would you make that decision for those that would come forward or those that would stay quiet? Why? What, what is going through your mind as I ask you this question? Oscar says, I would think about it for a long time. Okay, valid. But Marty says, now is the time to share the secrets. But David, on the other hand, says, well, it depends, really. Yeah, okay, I, I can get that. It depends on the situation, depends on the people. All right, all right. Well, they include the documents that were sent to Pinotti. They included two June 1933 telegrams in Italian, obviously, one demanding absolute silence over an alleged landing on national soil of an unknown craft. And those were in quotation marks. Another, dated June 13th, threatens the immediate arrest and maximum penalties for any journalist reporting news of an aircraft of unknown nature and origin. Now, we do need to keep in mind during this time frame in 1933, it was under the dictatorship of Mussolini. And with any dictator, they are in control of the media of all of the news. So I, I, I can understand this, this level of security when it comes to this crash, because the less people that know about it, the better they can, or I guess the more time they have to kind of figure out this odd piece of tech, right? But the more minds that are coming forward, the higher chances you have of trespassing, of someone ruining the, the, the object, right, or the technological vehicle so on and so forth. Other countries could come forward and attempt to rob that object, right? And this has been a mindset during during that time frame and even up to today because it would be classified in 1933 as a national security issue. And we hear that in the year 2023 as well when it comes to the UFO phenomenon and people coming forward about debris, alien debris and crash retrievals, right? It's nothing new. It hasn't changed. Will it change? Probably not. But it says here that immediate recasting of any leads from the newspapers bearing said news is ordered, the second telegram had mentioned. Both say they are, they are by personal order of Mussolini himself. Other documents, Santupinotti, this guy right here, refer to a mysterious government department known as the 33 Cabinet, or RS-33 Cabinet, which refers to the special research, supposedly set by the Italian dictator to manage the retrieval and study of the alleged saucer wreckage, as well as other UFO incidents. Dun, dun, dun. Are there other cases that you and I are not familiar with when it comes to Italy and UFO crashes? Maybe. Bob, thank you so much. It says for the gift card. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. We're looking at 30 right there. That word is unusual. Oh, and Chris, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for doing the calculations as well. 42. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Oh, and Lotus Fire, thank you for that. Let me just go back. Do 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 do. Perfect. Okay, forty-seven. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so Pinotti says that RS thirty-three was uh, in charge by the Nobel Prize winner and the inventor of the radio. Those are in quotation marks, which is Marconi. Okay, we talked about this also yesterday as well, and I shared my thoughts with you where he had mentioned, allegedly here, that when he saw the craft for the first time, he told Mussolini, we can't reverse engineer this. This is so extreme. This is so beyond my understanding and my knowledge. I can't do anything with it. And then I said, when this was mentioned, allegedly to Mussolini, Imagine him getting that information, being told no. That is not a thing to any dictator. They are not used to being told no. So I, I don't know how they treated Mar, uh, Marconi after this incident, allegedly, but it, it, is, it is a wild one and one I think that's pretty interesting to, to mention. Now, 
Pinotti was also sent handwritten memos on paper with the government agency letterhead dated August 22nd, 1936, three years later, which include a sketch and description of a cylindrical aircraft with portholes on the side and white and red lights spotted flying over northern Italy. So piecing together the mysterious documents, Pinotti was able to pinpoint a certain person er or a certain area, an aircraft facility near the alleged crash site outside of Magenta, a satellite town of Milan, as the likely site where the supposed wreckage was stored. Because while he was receiving this paperwork, we didn't really know where the crash actually happened. We had an idea. But after he received more of this back in 1996, he was thinking, okay, I kind of have a general idea of where this crash happened, which I think is awesome. Now, if I were in his shoes right then and there, I would grab my metal detector so fast and make a trip to Magenta, Italy, in and around that area. Also, who doesn't want to go to Italy? right? You get the best food on the planet. Um, me, I'd go in a heartbeat. But I think it's really, really interesting because another thing is that I receive a lot of comments of people saying, why are these UFO sightings? Why are these UFO crashes happening only in the United States? And they're not. They are happening all over the world. Italy is a great example of this. But I think, and this is my opinion here, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this because that's all we have right now, our thoughts. And that is, it's a high possibility that the reason to why the United States is getting more of that attention when it comes to UFO sightings and crashes is one, there's always been that interest amongst the American people. Um, also, it's decently populated. But I think, I think, on another aspect of this, there's a lot of people potentially looking for this. Now, if we look at other countries and their cultures, maybe during these older time frames, let's say 1930, 1920, 1940, 1950, you're also dealing with a totally different culture as well. And I think that plays a really, really big role when people have UFO sightings because they can interpret it as an angel, as a demon, as as just something very mundane when it comes to space and potentially our atmosphere. But as the saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but also it all depends on our perspective and our environment and our culture on how we perceive events to happen or as they happened, right? So I think that plays a really big role. Is that the answer? Probably not. That's probably not the answer. But that's where I am currently in my mindset when it comes to this. But I want to hear your thoughts in the live chat and definitely in the comments as well. Because when you share your thoughts and your ideas, it opens my mind to these other possibilities and not just mine, but other people that are also reading the comments as well. For instance, I'll give you another example. Yesterday, when we covered Cape Girardeau, people were writing comments with the question that I asked, why would they bring in a reverend during this time frame, bring in another witness, bringing in another liability? And I got, I got a handful of really, really great comments that I read this morning, funny enough. And they were saying, well, not only was it a different time period, totally get that. But also Cape, Gir Cape Girardeau was a very, very Catholic town as well, um, or Christian town, excuse me. And so they also weren't aware if this was an alien or just something that was unknown to the American people. Could it have been, you know, Japanese, uh, which was somewhat someone had written in a comment. They hadn't even seen those types of people during that time frame in that small town in Minnesota. So when I read your comments, they are very helpful to me and other people as well. This article goes into a great more detail. If you want to continue reading it, I will place that link in the description box below. But let's move on over to our next case. And this one, I actually have a video for you. It is a UFO sighting in Canada. If you're Canadian, hit the like button right then and there. If you want to go to Canada or you've been to Canada, hit that like button. When you do, it really does tell YouTube, hey, we need some more UFO transparency, right? Okay, so let's pull this up. 
in just a moment. And James, thank you so much for the RV fund. I appreciate that. Great show last night. 12 recovered UFOs. Loved you and Jimmy. Thank you. That was so nice of you. All right, let's pull this up. This is a video and I will read the details on this as we play it. There is no audio. The actual video did not come with audio. So let's get into this. Because in the forest of Caledon Community, Ontario, Canada, a hunting camera turned uh, turned on at night when a raccoon approached it and accidentally filmed a strange object that flew over the ground. Now, this raccoon is stinking adorable, okay? But you can clearly see how nine lights lined up in one horizontal line appear of the, above the grass and smoothly rise upward, flying over the camera. And this appeared on the night of June 21st, 2003. Now, it's curious that the filmed raccoon did not react to the UFO in any way as if he did you know he might not have heard it or maybe he didn't see it we don't know again there is no audio when it comes to this trail cam which is a bit disappointing but the video was then sent to American UFO site MUFON author of the video pointed out that there were no houses or roads of any kind in the vicinity and that no aircraft route passed over this forested area it mentions in the video description you can find it on YouTube and I went ahead and I actually just uh, slowed it down and I zoomed in I can actually bring that in over here yeah i'll put it right there yeah but he mentions in the U uh, youtube description it says i was checking my trail cam a raccoon set off the cam nine lights came into view from the right corner of the video the area where it rose from has trees behind it 30 feet high and there is no road or flight paths for planes in the area unbelievable whatever this is now it was also pointed out and that description, uh, there were very tall trees on the side where the UFO came from, and thus the object could not just fly through them. However, what do you think it really is? Now, in the comments, people uh, were mentioning, oh, it has to be drones because drones can fly in that certain formation. Totally get that. Could it have been an airplane with extra lights on it? Eh, maybe. Could it have been a UFO? Possibly. When I first saw this, it reminded me of the Phoenix Lights in 1993. That's what came to mind. But we don't we don't know. Now, what's odd is that the raccoon did not react to to it at all. If it was an airplane, it would be pretty you would think it might be decently loud if it's if it's pretty close to the ground or if it was drones, maybe that raccoon would at least look up. But we didn't see that. But it's a UFO because it's unidentified. We don't know what it is. Now, I'm not saying it's extraterrestrial in origin. While when, when we hear the term UFO, we, we immediately think aliens. No, it really just means unidentified. We are not sure what this object is. Okay? So that is what's really, really odd and um, interesting about this. But I would like to see daylight footage of that area. Is there any? From what I saw, no, there wasn't. But it, that might change. Maybe the person that had filmed this will will take people's suggestions and film it, film that area in the daytime. But it would be nice to get a comparison between the day and the night. But let, let's hear your thoughts. Do you think this is something weird? Do you think it's something very, very mundane and we shouldn't pay attention to it? Let's hear what you have to say hear your thoughts oh i and i will share the link to that video on where i found it in the description box below along with the article because the article does link the video okay so you'll get both awesome so you can see it for yourself and i'll play that just one last time for you it is pretty crazy crazy yeah, it was in June, but the article was just written about it. That's why we're covering it this week for Strange News. But you are right. It happened to June 21st, which, you know, wasn't really last week, but it was at arm's length. Like, still pretty close. Yeah. Obviously quiet, yes, says Little. Did it blink out, says David? It says the only video that we have. That's an interesting question. But Rusty says, weather balloon. 
could it have been? It would have to be a lot of weather balloons next to each other. You would think so, right? Good point, Marty. Well, that is a pretty short article when it comes to this one. But let's let's keep keep putting down your thoughts and your ideas on that video. Moving on to our next one, we're getting into the paranormal here. How many of you have seen any of the any of the Insidious movies? Any of them? I, I'll I'll tell you, I haven't seen them. I'm I'm not I'm not in that category because I'm not jump scares. Do they? My heart is this big, so any jump scare, I will pass out on the floor. But let's pull this up because this is actually relevant when it comes to strange news and things that are really weird. Not only is Insidious the Red Door coming out today, there was an interview with the cast not too long ago. And they mentioned, you know what, I'm just going to read this to you. I'm just going to read this to you because it's really cool. So as it turns out, producer Jason Bloom, this guy right here, who has overseen the who has overseen the paranormal activity franchise and the recent Halloween trilogy had a paranormal encounter as well. And this is what we want to hear. We want to hear people that write paranormal and scary movies for a living to have a paranormal encounter, right? That's what we live for. Well, this guy did. So let's get into it. So he mentioned in the interview and it says, quote, I've only had one experience with anything supernatural. About 30 years ago, I lived in a storefront basement on Cosby Street in Manhattan. I paid $300 a month in Manhattan, which was pretty amazing. And I had a friendly ghost visit me at the foot of my bed. And it was not a dream. It was a person standing there holding another person. They looked at me and I looked at them. And I will remember it until I die. I didn't feel threatened, and I always say I don't believe in ghosts, but I did see this ghost. Dun dun dun. And that, that might sound kind of boring to some of you, and and I get that. But let's back it up, because why did I bring this up? Well, not only is this movie coming out for all of my paranormal horror fans out there, but it's really cool to hear people have encounters. But on top of that. Just because you might have a ghost encounter or if you ever hear people say, oh, I had something really strange happen to me, it's not always negative. And I'll give you a great example. My mom used to tell me a story that when she had just married my father, almost every single night in the middle of the night, she would be sleeping next to him and she would wake up at some strange time and her eyes would open really wide and she would see someone staring at her every single night. She ended up finding out that the person that stared at her after looking through her ex-husband's album, because they're, they're, they're divorced now, looking through the, the family album, she was like, that's him. That's the person that's always staring at me. And, and she shows my father. And my dad says, that's my dad. That's, that is my dad. So it turns out her father-in-law, who had passed away many decades prior was watching her sleep every single night. Now, she had mentioned to me that she never felt threatened. She never really felt scared, but she she felt watched. And I think that's really scary, especially if you just get married to someone, right? You're already having ghost encounters. Totally not cool. But that was one story that always stuck with me when it came when it comes to anything paranormal in my family. And that is my mother's encounter that she had. Have you had something similar happen to you? Have you heard of someone have a similar encounter? Let me know in the comments. Let me know in the live chat. And John, I thank you so much for the giveaway. Awesome. 52. Perfect. That word is hashtag unusual. Okay. All right. Well, it gets even weirder in this interview that was just released because Sinclair Daniel, one of the breakout new characters from Red Door, said that as a kid, she felt like she had a ghostly encounter every week. She mentions here, quote, how I remember it. I think that was definitely a ghost. Also, I was six, but I'll have to give my younger self the benefit of the doubt. Wilson, meanwhile, confirmed that he had experienced an otherworldly encounter, and he kind of laughed when he was telling the story, 
But he mentioned, there was a time when I heard voices and footsteps and stuff in my house. It was real. But if anything, I've learned that you can have some experiences and they don't have to be bad. So I chose to believe that maybe it's a ghost, but I it doesn't have to be a bad ghost which is what I had mentioned a little bit earlier. But the same thing with Jason Bloom right here. He had an encounter, but he didn't see it too negative. Well, as I had said a little bit earlier, Insidious the Red Door is coming out today, July 7th. If you watch it, let me know what you thought about it. Uh, for me, again, I'm not really into jump scares. My heart is this big. So I will, I will cry and my heart would just stop right then and there. But we have 268 people watching this live, only 146 likes. Can we get to at least 200? Because the show from yesterday has, I can't believe this, it has over 10,000 views and it seems that the likes drove the algorithm to give the show more transparency. Oh my gosh, what just happened? My heart just stopped. Oh. So let's try that again. Let's get to a lot of likes. But if you heard that, that was the Canon ADD. I just started using it yesterday. But that little flicker was not was not cool. <laughs> that was a jump scare to me. But let's get into something in the more science aspect. And I'm going to share my screen here. I try to calm down a little bit. Whew. All right, let's pull this up. Getting into our next article today. Let's see this. Because this is the Mars Habitat in Houston. So NASA has officially begun one of its largest and most intriguing experiments to date. Four non-astronauts will be locked into the space agency's simulated Martian base. Okay, the Roger Average Joe, these aren't just casual volunteers. No, they have a pretty extensive background. So this experiment will simulate the life of four people in a small enclosed place who will be cut off from the usual, you know, day to day earthly life, such as smartphones, the Internet, TV and so on. I don't know how they're going to do that. This particular experiment is the first of three planned missions that will be implemented in phases under the CHAPIA project, similar to the crew health and performance study. So participants in the experiment, including research scientist Kelly Huston, civil engineer Ross Blockwell, emergency physician Nathan Jones, and U.S. Navy microbiologist Anka Cerulil. Sarah Ruley will spend 378 days on the isolated 3D printed Martian base. Now, that's already something super cool. Not only will they be chilling in a Martian base for a little over a year, but it's 3D printed. Fun fact, right? That's pretty cool. We live in a pretty cool time when it comes to that, don't you think? And Cosmic Dave, thank you so much for the RV fund or for yourself. I, I thank you. Your inquisitiveness. I admire that. Thank you for that. That is so nice. <laughs> Hit that like button, all right? Yeah, totally free, says Don. That's right. But first, I'm going to sip on my orange mango pineapple smoothie. Mmm. Delicious. Filled with yummy vitamins. Nom nom. So the purpose of this particular experiment is to test the impact of such isolated and cramped spaces on the human body and mind. And why is this so significant? Well, first off, it's for when people are ready to go to Mars, they're not going to have internet, they're not going to have smartphones or TVs, they're going to be in a pretty enclosed place. I get that. But in the day and age that we live in, this is rough. And there were some amazing papers written a few years back, they're still coming up today, about the excessive amount of dopamine that your average person is getting because of social media, because of smartphones, and because the access to sugar that we ingest, which is a lot more than what we should take every single day should only be about 20 grams and we're exceeding that by like 100 200 percent it's unbelievable but when we have a free moment and look i am i am guilty of this okay when we have a free moment we grab our phone we go through whatever we want to go through have it be a game have it be social media because a lot of us i'm not saying everyone 
But a lot of us have issues with being alone with our thoughts or when we become really bored really fast. So we need that dopamine hit a lot more than what we used to 20 years ago, right? Uh, when you think about it, when you take a step back, all right, and you think, should I be on my phone, watch TV, read a book, or just sit down and do nothing? You are not going to pick the last option. Maybe a handful of you, but the majority, no. And it's because of the world that we live in now. We are surrounded by media, social media, advertisements, almost almost 24-7. I feel like even in our dreams, we're scrolling through social media. <laughs> I get those for you sometimes. It's, it's pretty scary. But study participants will do everything possible to maintain their physical and mental health at an optimal level. And the results that will be received at the end of the experiment will help NASA understand how a long stay, for example, on Mars can affect astronauts in the future. Now, an accurate understanding of how a simulated Martian base will affect humans is essential to shaping an effective NASA approach to mental and physical health issues in future deep space missions, including the Artemis program, during which astronauts will temporarily reside on the moon. Now, this is a little person for scale, but they're going to be able, these four, these four non-astronauts will be, well, they'll, they'll have like a little exercise room, they'll have medical care, like a, an areas for medical care, they'll have a kitchen, they'll have private crew quarters, there'll be two bathrooms, and they will work and they will also take care of crops as well, which is super cool. I feel like we should learn that in school, but we don't. Basic agriculture, I would love to learn how to grow literally anything. But I bought a basil twice and it died within like two weeks. It was really depressing. But what's even crazier about this particular experiment is that not only will they be in enclosed space for longer than a year, but on top of that, there will be created chaos as well. This should be in a documentary. This should be filmed all throughout for everyone to see like a reality TV show. Four people who don't know each other too well in an enclosed place. And at the same time, NASA is going to be watching and be like, let's create chaos right now. In the sense of, <laughs> let me explain this, okay? Because participants will perform simulated walks on the Martian surface as well as grow some crops using the same approach that NASA hopes will be used during real flight to Mars, but also during the entire experiment, participants will have to independently cope with equipment failures, stresses, and allocate a limited amount and be allocated a limited amount of resources as well, which is going to just add to a high level of stress. And I feel like in 2023, all of us have a pretty high level of stress, more so than what we should have. That and anxiety as well. So this is going to be really, really interesting. And that's why I said this should be a reality TV show, because these guys are going to be under a lot of pressure for a very long period of time. Also, like, what if you, what if you have a, a plumbing issue? That's going to be pretty brutal with people that you don't know, right? Yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, Ron says, I'm stressed just hearing about it. Hey, buddy, I'm on that same boat with you. Thank you, Barty, for uh, all of the laughing from Father Ted. For those that don't know, <laughs> that character is from, is from Father Ted, my all-time favorite TV show. That never fails to make me laugh. Nathan says, interesting. I like the idea. Would you, would you volunteer? I don't know. I'm not really feeling it. And hi there. <laughs> Good to see you. Ah. Yeah, chaos interesting name very appropriate for this sounds like fallout vault in mars yeah yeah it does it is yeah um pretty wild stuff and that article also goes into more detail for those that want to read it you you can that link will be in the description box below as well hmm Sunspot, no toilet paper, the last pizza pizza. Who will have the TV control? Well, there'll be no TV there. So that's going to be pretty interesting. All right.
moving on to our next one because it's also something that I brought up yesterday. And that was I am waiting for a time where I can put a USB in my brain and share memories, share thoughts and ideas because I struggle with communicating my thoughts and ideas, right? But if you just give it to someone using like visuals and like the whole environment, it would be so much easier. Well, I came across an article that's very appropriate for that. So let's pull that up. But this is nothing new. This has been in science fiction for a decent amount of time in sci-fi movies as well. But scientists have been looking into something very similar to this. And the idea of our mind could live on in another form after our physical body dies, um, which has been something that we've spoken about not only on this channel, but they've probably seen on hundreds of sci-fi movies time and time again. This has been going on since like the 1950s. But recent developments in science and technology are taking us closer to a time when mind uploading could graduate from science fiction to reality. In 2016, BBC Horizon screened a program called The Immortalist, in which a Russian millionaire unveiled his plans to work with neuroscientists, robot builders, and other experts to create technology that would allow us to upload our minds to a computer in order to live forever. Now, I'm taking that one step lower here, and I'm just saying I just want to share my memories, thoughts, and ideas to people. But living on in a computer, that's kind of a past for me. But it sounds, it just sounds really crazy. It really, really does. But is it in our future? I feel like we honestly, honestly, if I was alive during the 1970s, I would say by 2020, we would have this technology easy in the bag, no problem. But uh, here we are in 2023 and uh, we're still just kind of thinking about it. But we still don't know what the mind is. I mean, consciousness in general is a really big mystery. It's unsolved. We have speculations. We have ideas. But many of us struggle to conceptualize what consciousness is. And when I say us, I'm referring to scientists right here. But in this... It mentions here that at the time, this Russian millionaire confidently predicted that this would be achieved by 2045. A bit disappointed there. And while this might seem unlikely, but we, he had mentioned, but we are making small but significant steps toward a better understanding of the human brain and potentially the ability to emulate or reproduce it. Now, the whole brain emulation is one potential route to mind uploading. Detailed scans of the brain and its activity would allow us to reproduce a person's biological brain and potentially the mind in a computer. But the most promising technique is the scan in copy, where the structure of a perceived brain would be scanned in detail using, for example, the technique of electron microscopy. My, my, yeah, And this would gather the data needed to produce a working copy of the brain. However, as many believe that the brain is embodied and function as it does because of its relationships to other parts of the body and environment that we sense and interact with. Now, they're not bringing up consciousness here, but that's okay. At some point, they probably will. Cause I don't think you'll be able to do one without the other. But with this, scientists are looking into this. They're thinking, this is a great idea. Who doesn't want to live forever? I'm one of those people. I don't want to live forever. But aside from that, your average person does. And what's the best way to do it? Well, just put them in a, put them in a computer. Or should you, you can then put them in a robot. Why not? Is that our future? Oh, you betcha it is. But you would think it would have already happened by now, by the year 2020, which is like a really big hype of a year. A few decades back, people were like, 2020, we're going to have flying cars. There's going to be robots everywhere. It's going to be an easy life. We're not going to have poverty and famine. It's going to be awesome. None of those things happened. But what if the consciousness is literally like a ghost energy? Is is this like, you know, inserting your ghosts into a computer? I mean, oh my gosh, like, like this sounds like a, a movie script. It really does. But truth is stranger than fiction, right? But what do you think? I mean, on the chat or in the comments now or after the show, because this is something that is just 
really worth thinking about. And we just need one more like to get to 200. But 250 is the goal. Also, we'll be doing that gift card giveaway for $52 right now for a Starbucks or Amazon gift card. And that word is hashtag unusual. Place that in the live chat if and only if you are watching this live. David says, we always thought by the year 2000, flying cars would be a thing. I know. You know what? I know. And I'm very disappointed that we don't have them yet. They're still in the works. You can pre-order some. We did cover that a while ago. And they're going to be launching in the next few years, supposedly. But no, we need flying cars yesterday. We really do. It'd be so cool. You would also need like a very special license for a flying car, don't you think? I did. I think so. Android says, I don't want to live forever, but I would like to, to slow aging to about 20% so I could live 500 years and look 80 at 400. Rock on. Okay, I can take that. <laughs> That's very funny. But what's interesting is that neurotechnology or methods to directly record or modify human brain activity is rapidly advancing. And examples of neurotechnology, such as brain-to-computer interfaces and an implantable device known as Stentrode, made headlines earlier this year because they allowed severely paralyzed patients to control a computer by thinking and to conduct online activities like shopping and sending emails. Now, I love out of all the tests that they did, they're like shopping is very important. Online shopping is super important. <laughs> sending emails, totally get. Doing research, all right. But shopping, top priority on the list for these scientists. Nice. Well, such developments, along with advances in artificial intelligence, are allowing us to better decipher brainwaves. So in the future, they may well allow us to write to or modify the brain. This is our future. We cannot run away from this. But I wish we would have had it a while back. Like, you would have expected that we would have. We didn't, and we don't. But they're saying by the year... 2046, we might, which in terms of technology and science advancements, that's pretty close. That, that, that's, that's an arm's length, really is. But this next story I have for you, it was an article that I just came across. It was just recently released, but is, it is an older case. However, this story blew my mind, and I said I have to share this. It's so crazy. I don't even care what year it's from. We are covering this story. So let me pull this image up. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you might not. I wasn't. And it's crazy. So let, let's pull up this image. And this took place in 1990. I know it's a while ago, but just put on your seatbelts. Literally. So on June 10th, 1990, British Airways Flight 5390 was flying from Birmingham, England to Malaga, Spain with 81 passengers and six crew members on board. Okay, Hold. let's keep going. The captain was Timothy Lancaster, a 42-year-old veteran pilot with more than 11,000 flight hours. And the co-pilot was Alastair Atchison, a 39-year-old with more than 7,500 flight hours, both pilots had flown the BAC 111 for over 1,000 hours, which is the plane that they are flying here. Now, listen to this, all right? And Cosmic, thank you for that. I'll write that down. The flight took off at 8.20 a.m. local time and climbed to a cruising altitude of about 7,300 feet. The weather was clear and calm, and the flight was expected to be routine. The pilots released their shoulder harnesses, and Lancaster loosened his lap belt. Now, at 8.33 a.m., the cabin crew were preparing for meal service, and one of them, Nigel Ogden, was entering the cockpit when a loud bang occurred. The left 
windscreen panel on Lancaster's side of the flight deck had separated from the forward fuelage, creating an explosive decompression that sucked Lancaster out of his seat and through the window at 17,000 feet in the air. Ogden reacted quickly and grabbed Lancaster's legs before he could be pulled out completely. He held on with all of his strength as Lancaster's upper body was exposed to the extreme wind and cold outside of the plane. The cockpit door was blown inward into the control console, blocking the throttle control and causing the plane to descend rapidly. The autopilot had disengaged and the flight documents and checklists were sucked out of the cockpit. Debris flew in from the passenger cabin, cabin and condensation filled the air. Ogden told the Sydney Morning that I whipped around and I saw the front windshield had disappeared and Tim, the pilot, was going out there with it. He had been sucked out of his seatbelt and all I could do and all I could see were his legs. So I jumped over the control column and grabbed him around his waist to avoid him going out completely. His shirt had been pulled off his back and his body was bent upwards, double over round the top of the aircraft. His legs were jammed forward, disconnecting the autopilot, and the flight door was resting on the control, sending the plane hurtling down at nearly 650 kilometers an hour through some of the most congested skies in the world. He continued, I thought I was going to lose him, but he ended up in a, in bent in a U shape around the window and his face was banging against the window with blood coming out of his nose and the side of his head. His arms were flailing and seemed about six feet long. Most terrifying were his eyes wide open. I will never forget that sight as long as I live. Okay, now this story goes into great more detail. This is not one that I have ever heard before. And I've never really been too scared of airplanes. I find them like pretty fun when they go when they go up. It's awesome. Um, but this, I'm going to keep my seatbelt on forever, never to take it off because that is really, really scary here. But they ended up contacting air traffic control. I said, we need to do an emergency landing. They attempt to explain what's going on. They do a quick landing 20 minutes later. So Lancaster is outside of the airplane for 22 minutes. All right. But... Here's really what happened. Okay, here's really, really what happened here. The day before, there was maintenance done on the windshield, and the person that made the new windshield put in the wrong bolts for the airplane. And that's how it got all messed up. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because an article was just recently written about it. Is it recycling old news? Sure. But there's a handful of us that were not familiar with this article. And I said, well, it was just recently published for me to read by. And I, and I thought we need to cover this because this is such a wild, strange story that I've never heard. But what about you? Have you heard of the story? Is it crazy? Jessica says this guy holding him is a hero. Oh, yeah. And Ron says, airplanes are fun when they work. Definitely. Because this this is not even 1% of what would casually happen on an airplane. You'd probably get more fistfights than you would for something like this. Chaos says, you're telling me he held on for 22 minutes? You betcha he did. He was ended up, both of them, the person holding on to him, Ogden, and Lancaster, were placed into the hospital. They were fine. Uh, Lancaster did have a few broken bones, but overall he was fine. And he ended up going back to work just a little under five months after the incident happened. Ogden, he just had some bruises. It wasn't too big for him, too much of an issue. But it's just one of those things that not everyone, but there's a handful of people, a, a good percentage of people that when they see something bad happening, 
they jump to the rescue. Others, they they freeze up and they're in shock. And some will run the other way. But in this case for Ogden, he saw what what was going down and he ran as fast as he could. He jumped over the column and held on to Lancaster's legs for dear life, literally, which is just unbelievable. And that's why I wanted to share this story because it's super duper strange. And I can read that into more detail, but now we're getting into the really weird here. Like when I'm saying weird, I am saying really, really weird. All right, let's pull this up. I'm going to share this image first because I don't want to give too much away until I read it. But this one definitely belongs in the category of strange news. Because a mayor in Mexico has a new bride, but it's not what you think. Victor Hugo Sosa, mayor of San Pedro Juan, Juamelula, married a reptile named Alicia Andrea as part of an ancestral ritual meant to bring good fortune to his people. San Pedro, this location, is a town of the indigenous Chantal people. He mentions here, I accept responsibility because we love each other. That is what is important. You cannot have marriage without love. I yield to marriage with the princess girl. And this is what Sosa had mentioned in the reenacting ritual. Local lore refers to the female reptile, an alligator here, as the princess girl. Let's pull up another image. All dressed up, all cute and stuff. Yeah. See, there, there is Sosa marrying the alligator. So it says here that marriage between a man and a reptile has taken place for 230 years uh, for 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 two indigenous groups of people reaching peace through a marriage. Tradition says a Chantal king, represented in modern times by the mayor, married a princess girl from the Huava indigenous group, represented by an alligator-like marsh dweller um, in, in Mexico and Central America. Now, the marriage allows the sides to link with what is the emblem of Mother Earth, asking the all-powerful for rain, the germination of the seed, all these things that are peace and harmony for the Chantal people, said Jaime uh, Zarata, a, a journalist in that area. But it also says here that, that the reptile is taken from house to house before the ceremony, dressed in a headdress of ribbons, so residents can take her in their arms and dance. Her snout is bound shut, and then she is dressed in a white bride costume and transported to the town hall for the big event. After the wedding, the mayor dances with the bride to the sounds of traditional music. And as Sosa says, we are happy because we celebrate the union of two cultures. People are content. I have never heard anything like this before. I mean, I've heard some pretty odd people, uh, you know, marrying weird objects. Uh, but for it to be a cultural thing, it is really interesting. A, a ritual that has been taking place for the last 230 years. It's a bit weird. But what is... Uh, kind of comical here is that the alligator's mouth is all tied up because this, she's probably being married without her consent right i don't think anyone really wants that but it it is um have you heard anything like this before <laughs> please let me know because i haven't nothing absolutely nothing has compared in my memory bank that can compare to the story it's pretty weird but let's say with this alligator having its mouth tied up, if it wasn't, she'd eat the husband. So it's tied up to not eat her new husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty odd. But what what are your thoughts on this? Go on, share share what you think. Because it's, it's weird. And this is strange news. <laughs> John says... Nothing surprises me anymore. You know what? That's how it should be. That should be the mentality. I like that. <sighs> I 
it's um it's weird cosmic says this is so weird yeah yeah it is well let's get into something a little bit less weird but something that we all love hearing about talking about and that's the bermuda triangle well i'm gonna bring in some research here not my research but other researchers let's pull this up as a visual aid so we can continue onward because this place has captured the imagination of not just your average person but of scientists as well and scientists from the university of southampton uk have found the cause of the mysterious disappearances in the famous Bermuda Triangle of about a hundred ships over the past century could in fact just be huge waves. Take it or leave it. That's, that's what the research says. Let's continue onward. The results of the study were published by the Sailing Scuttlebutt Portal, and scientists in the laboratory tested one of the most popular versions, and it lies in the fact that giant waves that suddenly arise due to the weird area in which it's at of and of the local climate becomes the cause of the death of ships. And and they are caused by atmospheric currents and the height of the waves can reach 30 meters in height. Scientists have simulated such storms. And for analysis, the researchers used a real life 180 meter American v um, vessel, the Cyclops, the USS Cyclops, you've probably heard of that case, we've covered it before, which in 1918, it left the port of Rio de Janeiro with a cargo of manganese ore and 300 passengers on board. The ship mysteriously disappeared into the Bermuda Triangle. The experiment showed that the Cyclops, under the influence of 30-meter waves, would go under the water in just a few minutes, breaking in half. And according to a, according to the study, a similar fleet, fleet, fate likely befell other missing ships. Now, that might burst some people's bubble. Is that the case for all of the strange things that happened there? No, of course not. But it is something that has captured the imagination of scientists as well to say, maybe it's just something mundane. Maybe we can find answers. But it doesn't give us answers, guys, to missing aircraft. Okay, yes, missing ships. Could it have been big waves? Sure, valid. Okay, I can buy that. But... What about airplanes and also ships being found with all of the crew and passengers missing, but ships left intact, intact? Does that answer, d does big waves answer those questions? Also, no, but it might answer a few, a few of our questions, but not all of them. At least not yet. But would I love for a scientist to give us the answers on why the Bermuda Triangle is so weird? Heck yes, I would love that. Because then it wouldn't be unexplained. It would be explained. And some of us would finally have our curiosity satisfied when it comes to this location. But big waves doesn't answer all the questions. It doesn't fit all of the bills. Maybe two out of like 50. But I had to share it because it is an update when it comes to science advancements, scientific research, and the notorious Bermuda Triangle. Right? I think so. This one I'm just going to very, very quickly touch on because it's not strange, but I, this is one point I actually just want to make on it. And that is about the Nobel Prize, right? We always hear about it. Well, we always hear about like the older versions of it, like from years prior. We don't hear about the modern stuff, like who the winners are of today. <laughs> we don't. At least I don't. I'm, I'm not kept up to date on it. But again, I'm making this very, very short. Winners of the Nobel Prize in psychology or medicine tend to reduce their research output after claiming the prestigious honor, according to a new study, suggesting that bagging the prize isn't so desirable for those who want to stay productive and relevant. Okay, that's all I'm going to read about this. But also the analyzed data of the Nobel Prize winners was, was from 1950 to 2009. And what they found was that 
these these amazing winners, these absolutely brilliant minds, once they receive the award, they're like, yeah, I feel like I just capped to the top of my life. I think I'm fine. I can just go downhill from here, do a little bit less research, place a little bit less effort. But it's okay because my name is already written all over the Nobel Prize. And what I'm getting at is, even if you're an absolute brilliant, amazing mind, you can still fall to your ego. Easy. It happens to everyone. And don't be fooled by just amazing brains because they, they also fall to their ego as well. That's what I wanted to touch on. I thought it was interesting. So it doesn't matter if you're five years old or if you're 90. Once you get an award, you think to yourself, you know, I'm pretty good for today. I, I feel like I feel like I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish for the rest of my life. You are never done. You can always do better. You can always push yourself a little bit harder. So just because you win something doesn't mean that you should just decline afterward. Unless maybe like you're just really, really tired. Then I get that. All right. Now we're going to speed through these two. These are pretty weird. But not like crazy insane. But I do want these. I'm going to pull this up. Because soon to be on the market are these reading glasses. And you're like, what? Christina, reading glasses? Hold on. Let me explain. This is a sole ebook reader. So when you feel like laying down, but you don't want to hold a book, all right, you put on these glasses and then you have a tiny little remote on the side and you can flip the pages. Take a look at the inside of these glasses, right? You can see the words. Isn't that super cool? Might be pretty nerdy for some or pretty boring for others. I think this is awesome. Now, I'm going to tell you a really, really embarrassing story, okay? So actually, like maybe two years ago now, I was reading a book, like a paper book of the old fashioned stuff. And I thought to myself, what time is it? Do you know what I did? And I'm so embarrassed to tell the story. You know what I did? I double tapped my sheet of paper on the book, thinking that the time would just pop up. I've gotten too used to a cell phone where you just double tap and you get the time. That didn't happen. And I turned red in the middle of, of the living room by myself. And I was thinking, I never want to tell the story. But I've been simmering on it for the last year or two years. So I feel like it's appropriate to tell that story now. But with these glasses that can that you can read on, you can lay down, not have this tired arm while you're holding your book up and do it in a relaxing state. I found that super cool. And you can read more about that in the description box below for that link. If you're actually interested, it's not on the market yet. We don't know how much they are, but I thought it was super cool. Last thing for you, before we do our prize drawing, that word is hashtag unusual, is how many of you are Pepsi fans over Coke? Let me know. I'm a fan of neither. I really, I don't like soda. I don't like, I don't like the, sh the intense sugar. It, it, it's weird for me, which I love sugar, which is like really ironic. But are you a Pepsi fan or a Coke fan? Let me know in the comments I and mean, on the live chat as well. Let's pull up this image here because Pepsi just created a, a new item on the market and it's not a drink, <laughs> but it's actually a condiment by the name of Cola Chup, which is Pepsi infused ketchup. You know, you love it or you hate it. Um, it's up to you to decide. I think it's really weird. Now, you won't be able to find this at the grocery store in anywhere. It's only sold in four different ballparks in the United States. It was just launched on July 4th. Very appropriate. Dig it. Dig it. But um, I, I did read some reviews on this cola chup to let you know if, if it's worth trying or not. And it's a bunch of mixed feelings. Some people love this new this new condiment which is again it's it's pepsi infused ketchup and others are thinking and saying it's a bit too sweet i can taste a hint of cinnamon and that was a big turn off for me any condiment that has cinnamon is a big no-no that sounds gross but online they're using the hashtag hashtag better with pepsi where you can have a nice delicious hot dog with cola chop 
which it reminds me something from like the chum bucket from SpongeBob, where all of Plankton's food sounds nasty. Uh, the chum burger from the chum bucket. You got like kelp drinks. Like this is this sounds gross. Cola chup belongs at the chum bucket in the TV show SpongeBob because it, it does it just doesn't sound appetizing. Is it good? I don't know. Some like it, some don't. But if you're going to a ballpark or watching a ball game, the places to get this are in Chase Field in Arizona, Yankee Stadium in New York, Target Field in Minnesota, and in Detroit as well. That's where you can find it. If you're really a diehard baseball fan and or a diehard hot dog fan, you want to try this, let me know on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies or tag me when you go ahead and you try that for the first time. I'd like to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Photo says, sounds awful. I, I feel you on that one. But Steve says, now I want a hot dog. I'll tell you this. When I was reading the article, I thought to myself, should I make hot dogs for lunch? It's that great advertising, that subliminal messaging right there. You just got to see something and you think to yourself, you know what? That's a great idea. I should probably do that. And that is how ads work. But yeah, hot dogs can never go wrong. They're delicious. Pepsi and vanilla ice cream, says Edward. Yeah, like soda floats. I hear those are really good. They're not for me, but hey, I know they're very, very popular. All right, let's go ahead and get ready. Oh, we have 91 entries. That's so awesome. All right, I'm going to pull up this screen here to do our giveaway. That word is hashtag unusual. We have 91 entries. That's so awesome. If you enjoyed the articles that we covered, make sure to hit the like button. It lets YouTube know that you do want more UFO transparency and that you want more conversations such as this one or getting some more strange news. Who doesn't love strange news? I know most of you do. So for this drawing, it's going to be for a $52 Starbucks or Amazon gift card. That word is hashtag unusual in all caps as you see it here. And we will do that drawing super duper, super duper shortly. Okay. So I'll give you all a moment. All right. All right. Everyone, everyone ready? We got 93 entries. Come on. I'll give you six seconds. Five, four, three. Two, one, let's do that drawing. Here we go. The winner today. And while you wait, let me know in the live chat, in the comments, which article was your favorite? Alberto M, you are the winner. Congratulations. Please send me an email. That link is in the that link. That email is in the description box below. Send me your YouTube URL and your preference for a Starbucks or Amazon gift card, and I will get that sent to you rather shortly. Which is going to be pretty awesome. Congratulations on that for watching the live. That is so great. Also, if you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. Share your thoughts, your insights, your opinions, your experiences, and more. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. Also, check out my Instagram at strange paradigms for photos and reels as well. Also, Wolf, thank you so much for the super sticker. That is so awesome. Thank you for that. And make sure to subscribe. We do a bunch of live shows right here every single week. Hit the like button. I will see all of you pretty darn soon. I want to say thank you to all the super chats, super stickers, YouTube members, Patreon subscribers, everyone watching this live, and all of my incredible moderators as well. I could not do this without you. But that is it for today. I will see all of you guys soon. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. <laughs>